bless your name, God. Bless your name, God. Bless your name, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Bless your name.
Begin to open your mouth and give them your worship tonight. Hallelujah. We're no longer slaves to fear, for we are children of the Most High God tonight. Come on, give them your worship tonight. Give them your worship tonight. Give them your worship tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. We bless you.
going to share with you some of the measures that we do to clean and sanitize the facilities so that when you enter the house of the Lord, you can maximize your worship experience knowing that you're in a clean, sanitary environment. So if you'll join me, I want to welcome you to Eternal Life. Eternal Life Harvest Center has always maintained a spirit of excellence regarding the care of the facilities. After all, it is God's house. We believe in caring for God's house with diligence and being good stewards over the beautiful facilities that we are blessed to worship in. So when COVID-19 hit, we added some extra measures such as using gloves when passing out tithe envelopes and communion cups, temperature checks for iKids and eLife group meetings, individually packaged foods and snacks for iKids and eLife, and we modified our services to allow for proper social distancing, which brought about the amazing parking lot services where the power of God is changing our community for God's glory. We modified our check sheets to be completed before and after service. These check sheets include such items as wiping banisters, microphones, cameras, laptops, door handles, all flat surfaces, as well as spraying over the chairs. Sister Yolanda Smith truly has a heart for keeping God's house in excellent order. She joined Five Star Ministries in 2017 and became a department leader in 2019. Sister Yolanda is always on post before service to make sure that facilities are cleaned and sanitized before the first person arrives for service. Hi, I'm Yolanda Smith. I'm department head of Five Star Ministry, and also uh, that covers the sanitizing of the church. Right when COVID first started, we became strategic and we started using hand sanitizer and we immediately started social distancing. But as we came into this a little further, then we started sanitizing the church. Before every service, the sanctuary is sanitized, the bathrooms are sanitized. I cleaned the stalls wipe down all the faucets on the sink, soap dispensers, the paper towel dispenser, uh, the toilet paper dispenser, I wipe that down. In the stalls, I wipe down the handles, baby changing tables, those are wiped down where you lock the doors, anything where people will touch. In the sanctuary, the podium that the pastor speaks from is sanitized. From the front of the church all the way to the back, everything in the sanctuary is sanitized. The biggest change that we have made is the sanitizing part and making sure that it is consistently done before and after every service. The checklist is definitely new. That is something that is required by Knox County and the CBC. So we're following all of those guidelines. So this is the process that we use here at Eternal Life Harvest Center uh, as far as sanitizing our church before and after every service to ensure the safety of everyone that comes to our church to make sure that everyone feels comfortable to know that we're doing everything that we can to make sure that everyone is safe. Apex Retreat 2020. Where to even start, man? Every single person on that mountain experienced something, something life-changing. As Pastor Revan said, it was a supernatural encounter with God. So let's take a look at some of the things that led to those changes at the Apex Retreat 2020. Somebody say I'm ready right now. I am. Pastor Evans and Pastor Ashley divided the three days into Apex sessions. These sessions touched people through the wonderful word of God in so many different ways. God cannot use you to your fullest extent until he reveals you to you. But you can't have a mountain retreat without some fun and excitement either. There was food, games, talent shows. Am I supposed to just die? Some worship. And you can't have a firebrand encounter retreat without a bonfire. Both these sessions and games brought us all closer together. Everyone came out of their shells both physically and spiritually. Moses stepped out. Father God, we thank you that we can listen to our pastors pour into us, Father God. We thank you, Father God. 
On the first day, everyone was left wondering what to expect, but by the last day, everyone could recite the Apex vision statement without even looking. Only through three days of seeking God and building relationships could we not only recite the vision statement, but also internalize its true meaning. We then brought this newfound meaning within us down from the mountain and to the Sunday service on Anakazo 1, only for Anakazo 2 to be revealed to us and the rest of the congregation. It is not by coincidence but through faith that Pastor Evans and Ashley Karayuki will lead us and teach us how to win souls now that everyone understands the meaning of Apex. With this new understanding, we will be able to truly love both ourselves and one another passionately. They burn on a mountain and they are still burning. They didn't just go up there and come back the same. If you were at the Apex Retreat, I want you to stand up. We've got a lot of them that are out. Um, a lot of them that are out. A lot of them that were at the Apex Retreat are actually out doing Anacazo right now. So give it up for the Apex Retreat. Do y'all know that we had 40-something people at that retreat? And we had our young people baptized in the Holy Spirit. Can y'all thank God for that? How many churches do you know that have young people that are burning on fire for God? That had that had people baptized in the Holy Spirit. They bonded with God and they bonded with each other. And we need to praise God for that. Can y'all praise the Lord? Give, your, give him a hand of praise. Stand up on your feet and offer a sacrifice of praise. Because when these young people went up there and baptized with the Holy Spirit, do you remember what happened to you when you got baptized with the Holy Spirit? Do you know what that's going to keep them out of? It's going to keep them out of a lot of trouble. And they're going to go back to this generation and say, look what God did for me. Now I'm going to lay hands on you and you can be filled with the Spirit. We can give God a praise for that, y'all. That is an awesome, awesome blessing. I thank God for pastors. Our pastors that have such a passion for young people. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord today. And I just want to say that one more time. Welcome to the presence of the Lord. You have not just come to a Wednesday night service. This is a divine appointment from God Almighty. The Bible says where two or three people are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. And we just sang the song a while ago. He split the sea so that we can walk right through it. We are a child of God. God has delivered us. God has saved us. God has filled us. God has healed us. God has provided for us. God is amazing and God is worthy, worthy, worthy of praise. We magnify your great name tonight. God, we glorify your great name. You woke us up this morning, my Father. You have given us a mind to worship you. Father, you provided for us food, Lord God. You give us a right mind. Thank you, Lord God, that you are everything to us. And tonight, Lord God, we bring you the sacrifice of praise. Our bodies may be tired. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. And thank you for your mercy. You are welcome in this place, mighty spirit of God. Have your way in this place tonight. Feel, Lord God. Heal, Lord. Deliver, Father. Set free, Lord. And we thank you, Lord. We declare by faith we are forever changed just for being in your presence tonight. Just want to thank you guys for coming out on a Wednesday night. This is truly the place that the Lord wants us to be tonight. Just a few announcements. Announcements first. I want to welcome all of our online audience. We thank God for them. Thank God for the people that can't make it tonight, and we just welcome them tonight. Welcome all of you to the Harvest Center. Just a few announcements that we have. Two great events tomorrow night. I'm so excited about one of them. Hope Rising. Woo! Hope Rising is meeting at 6:30 tomorrow night. I invite you guys to come out if you haven't been a part of it. If you're interested in coming out for Hope Rising, um, please call the office to register. Also, we're having the Yak Group. The Yak Group is mostly the people that went on the retreat, y'all. 
there are young people who are on fire for the Lord. And so the YAC group will be meeting tomorrow night at 6.30 as well. And um, we ask you just to remember to call the office and register. And we ask you mainly to call the office to register because we order food for everybody that comes. And we need to get an accurate count so nobody leaves physically hungry. You're going to leave spiritually filled. But we want you to be physically filled as well. So please call the office. Um, I kids tonight, did y'all see all the young people? The, the young men over here and the young women over here. Precious Stones and Rock are meeting tonight. iKids is taking a break tonight. It's the fifth Sunday. Giving the iKids a volunteer, a, t a time for them who are with our kids every week to enjoy the service. And we appreciate our volunteers tonight. Um, next thing is, whoo, Church in the Wilderness. Y'all, the altar has been sanctified every Sunday that we've had those trailers out there with people that are coming to the Lord. And I was remembering today, one of the young men in the ministry had been really struggling with something and we had been praying and he was one of the first ones that came to the altar in Akaza one that first Sunday. And y'all, he's totally transformed. Walking, he dresses different, he talks different, he walks different. God is doing something at the church in the wilderness. So we invite you guys 10 30 prayer starts at 10 30 on sunday and the last announcement this is really important because this this first saturday of the month normally we have women's and men's uh e-life or e-life from women and men will be october the 10th this month instead of october the 3rd so please remember october the 10th not october the 3rd and you'll still need to call the office to register tonight so we thank god for all the great things that are happening around the harvest center one of the things thank you sister shelley that's true you know we have a lot to be grateful for and i said it last week i say it again we take for granted sometimes the blessings of god we take for granted souls souls that are saved we take for granted what god is doing in this ministry it's not happening everywhere but god is good god is good and we thank you lord god we desire more souls father we desire more souls for the glory of the almighty god if you would turn in your bible for our offering scripture tonight in matthew chapter 6 i have i like object lessons so, Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to read first, uh, starting with verse 19. It's a very familiar scripture. It's a lot of scripture, but it's a very familiar scripture. In Matthew 6, 19, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through or steal. And if you've ever had something stolen from you, you know that's a really bad feeling, especially if it's something that you work for. I remember we lived in a house that we were broken into four times. And I said, that's a terrible thing to have stuff stolen from you when you're out working. But the Bible says that we shouldn't lay up treasures down here on this earth because man can break through a window or break through a door or any kind of lock you can put on there somebody can find a way around that lock and they can break through and steal but he says if you lay up treasures in heaven nobody can steal the treasures that you lay on the altars of heaven and so i give you this good example this is the smallest denomination of a bill this is a one dollar bill dollar bill one hope it don't fall and dollar bill two so these dollars have the potential this has the potential to be treasure on earth and it has this has a potential to be treasure in heaven you ask how can that happen one I might not be able to buy very much but I can buy a pack of chewing gum with this one dollar that's a treasure on earth if you need a pack of chewing gum this one dollar I'm inspired by one of our great evangelists in the church that loves to give to other people. She would take $10 and say, how many packs of candy can I buy to give to souls to win people for the Lord? So this $1 has the potential to be treasure on earth or treasure in heaven, even a small denomination. And so we're going to skip down to verse 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God 
and mammon, which is riches. We can't serve them both. In verse 25, Jesus said, therefore, which means with that being said, I say this to you. Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? With all of your money, with all of your wisdom, you still cannot add one inch, one cubit to, to your stature. And he said, so why do you take thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And, I, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? Therefore, therefore, which means, again, with that being said now, take no thought for the morrow. And then he goes on to say, or say, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles, which are people with no covenant, seek after for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But do you know I never noticed before that that scripture was after the one that says, lay not up your treasures on earth. Because usually when we think of seeking God, we think about, I'm running after God. I'm running after God. But are we running after God with our money? Are we really running after God with our money? So we're going to recap here. Jesus said in this chapter, he started out in verse 19 talking about the role of money in our lives. He said not to store up wealth for ourselves down here on earth, but to store up wealth in heaven. Now we got a lot of classes and a lot of people that would teach you how to build wealth on this earth. How many people, even Christians, are talking about building up wealth in heaven? Where the moth cannot, cannot eat up and where the thief cannot break through and steal. He then says that we cannot serve God and money. And then he leaves off talking about laying up wealth and begins to talk about trusting God to supply all of our need. He ends the chapter saying, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I'd like to interject this. Our money represents us. It speaks for me and it tells about me. If I say I love God and I don't honor God with my life and my money, do I really love God? If I go out and I can spend a hundred dollars on an outfit when I got 50 in the closet at home, but I can pass by a Christian who's struggling, am I really honoring God with my money? Am I really seeking God with my money? And I'm going to end it with this. This is something the Lord gave me because y'all know I do math a lot. <laughs> if you make $7.25 an hour, which is the lowest amount that you're supposed to make, right? Minimum wage is $7.25, Sister Dorsell. $7.25 an hour and you work 40 hours a week, do you know that in 10 years you will have made $150,800? In 10 years, $150,800. And I thought, God, what did I do with all that money? Did that money benefit God? I'm not talking about, okay, I, the tithe is a given, y'all, because we're under... You know, the tithe is a given. But do I honor God with my life, with my money? Is my money speaking for me in heaven? Will my money be spoken about in heaven that I lived, lived to give? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. He's testing us there, y'all. He's saying, lay it out. You trust me. And this is what the word says in Luke 12, 42. It's God's good pleasure to give you the things of the kingdom. We, 
When we don't trust him, we take a little pit, just a little bit. And like Pastor said, we tip him. We just tip him. And that says, God, you're just enough. You're just enough. Just enough. You know, but do I seek God? Do I seek that my dollars, even my one dollar, is honored in heaven? That God would look at me at the end of the ten years and say, Yes, you honored me with your money. And so I said, Lord, help us to be kingdom-minded in our finances. Help us not just to be tithe-minded in our finances, but God Help us to be kingdom-minded in our finances. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not because I, the outfit that I buy, when I stand before the Lord, hey, the outfit's gone. It's moth-eaten and gone. But the work, the candy that I bought to give to the people on the street, that one dollar is speaking on my behalf. God, help us to be kingdom-minded. And so I want us to pray. Um, we've got several different ways, you know, that you can give here at the Harvest Center. One is to text ELHC to 77977. Or you can go to www.elhc.life and click on the Give button. Or you can do cash app to dollar sign Firebrand Nation. Or you can raise your hand and let one of the beautiful greeters hand you an envelope and you can give here in the Harvest Center. So if you would like to be served with an envelope tonight, if you would uh, lift up your hand and they'll serve you. Everybody serve? We're good? Okay, I want us to pray. Um, let's just pray that God would help us to be kingdom-minded. Heavenly Father, eh, God, we lift up even the dollars before you. The dimes, the nickels, the hundreds, the fifties, the thousands. We lift up everything to you tonight. Lord God, help us to seek you with our finances. Help us to seek first the kingdom of God in our finances. Help us, Lord, not, not to be looking how we can benefit ourselves, but Lord God, let us look beyond that. Give us a desire, Father God, to feed those that are hungry. Give us a desire, Father God, to clothe those that are naked. Give us a desire, Father God, to go out on the streets and win people to the Lord. And Father God, we thank you that today our dollars and our fives and our tens and our twenties and our hundreds and our thousands that they speak in heaven father god that we are a people that is kingdom minded and father god let us give you glory and honor in our finances and we ask this in the mighty name of jesus christ thank you father and amen amen and uh greeters you can take up the offering and tonight y'all we have a very special treat um pastor pastors our pastors are doing exactly what they preach they're out anacazoing. <laughs> They're out winning people to the Lord. They're preaching the gospel. But you know, pastor will never leave the house without a word. And so pastor is actually going to be in the house tonight. If you guys can give your attention to the monitors tonight, welcome our very own Dr. Reverend Pastor Evans Karayuki. Give it a hand of praise, please. What's up, Harvest Center family? I trust you well, and God has been good to you. What a powerful praise and worship we have had. What a mighty move of the Spirit. Aren't you glad for a house where we can come and gather and worship together? Hey, today, the teaching of the Word is going to be a little bit different. I actually love it in terms of the content that we're able to cover. But I want you to get your Bible, notebooks, and pen because I'm going to be teaching you through the screen. And um, I also want you to pray for me as I travel. My wife and I are traveling. We're going to see our pastor in Columbus, Ohio, and spend some time with the Bible College students in Columbus, Ohio. So we've taken a team there, and we're going to go preach the gospel. You know, I haven't been able to do this for the whole year, a majority of the year, so I thank God that uh, the nations are opening again and God has allowed us to be able to do this. I know um, the vision of the church is to take the gospel to the world. And as we do that, I want to let you know there is a word in the house. God has not left you without bread. There is a word in the house. So I'm actually just coming to ask for your prayers. And I thank God for the leaders, the leadership that's able to continue with things even as we travel, the, the leaders that allow 
uh, my wife and I to be able to do this. You know, um, the Bible says the least amongst us is as mighty as David. So we're going to go into the teaching for today. Um, that's what you're going to watch next. Make sure you get your Bible, notebooks, and pens. And whatever you're watching this, may the Lord truly bless you. See you Sunday. Love you. God bless you. Hey, family. Praise the Lord. I trust God has ministered to you supernaturally so far. I truly thank God for you. And I am delighted that I am able to come to you through this wonderful screen. You know, we thank God for technology. We thank God for the ability for us to uh, sit down and share the word of God together. I want us to, we've been in this series on signs of the times, and I wanted to get this uh, teaching out to you, specifically pertaining to building God's house. So I would like you to really take time and take notes and make a note of the teachings that I'm about to give you and the points that I'm about to give you. I want to talk to you about the blessings of building God's house. What are the blessings of building God's house? What are the blessings of being a builder of God's house? And it's fundamentally important, it's fundamental for all of us to get a good understanding of that we are responsible to be builders of God's house. What do I mean by building God's house? Now this is the time. Get your Bible, get your notebooks, and get your pens. You know, we love the word, the word of God around here. If you are a first time visitor, first time connecting with us, I am so delighted that you have chosen to come and spend time with us. My name is Dr. Evans Kariuki, and I look forward to meeting you one day and giving you a big hug and just uh, getting to hear more about what God has gifted you to do in his kingdom. Let us get into the word of God because we have many scriptures to go through and uh, many scriptures to cover. If you've gotten your folder on signs of the times, this is in addition to the notes that you have. So please make sure you write, uh, you write your notes as we go on. And we're talking about building God's house. We're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 and connect building God's house to the end times. So we're going to connect building God's house to the end times. Hebrews 10, 25. The Bible says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I'm going to read it one more time. The Bible says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. What is the writer of Hebrews talking about? The writer of Hebrews is saying that as you see the end of the world, as you see the world coming to an end, one of the greatest temptations that will be there for believers is to forget the assembling of one another. The one of the greatest temptations will be for us to forsake going to church. The church will be under attack. The church will be under attack that people will not have a desire or a passion to assemble together. My God, in 2020, the body of Christ and the church of Jesus Christ is under attack. There are many Christians already. Church attendance was at a decline. And now we are many Christians who no longer value going to the house of God, who no longer value the altars. Now the reality is this. We as Bible teachers should have taught more about God's house, should have taught more about valuing the assembling of one another as believers. Now, when we say the church, I want you to think about two things. Number one, the house of God, the building. Number two, you think about you as the body of Jesus Christ. The Bible says the body is made up of many parts coming together. The hand coming together with the elbow, 
the elbow coming together with the shoulder, the left hand with the right hand, the right hand with the left hand, and the body coming together with Jesus Christ being the head and we being the body. Come on, can you say it right there? I'm part of a body. Come on, just declare it right now. I am part of the body of Jesus Christ and I'm fitly knit and I am assembled for the glory and to the honor of the Almighty God. So let us learn about assembling. Why is assembling and building God's house, being part of this building, important? The Bible says that the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. What was he talking about? Talking about Zion. Zion is the building. Zion is the house of God. Zion is where the altar of God is. And in Zion, there is one cornerstone. And that cornerstone is Jesus. Jesus. So write this point down. The cornerstone of every church is Jesus Christ. And when we assemble, we are assembling in his name. The word assemble means to come together with a purpose. Not just coming together for the sake of coming together. No, no, no. This is more than a gathering. And we must distinguish the word gathering and the word assembly. The table that I'm in right now, very nice table if you see it, came in different pieces. This top piece was one piece. This other piece was another piece. The legs was another piece. And somebody had to assemble them together. While it was separated, it had the potential of being a table. But it wasn't yet a table. It was different pieces separated. But God comes and says, I don't want you gathered. I don't want you separated. I want you assembled. So here is the first point. When you assemble, you assemble with a mission. So assembling in God's house gives you a mission, gives you a purpose, gives you a directive for your life. Do you know when you assemble, when you come to God's house, I want you to think about it. How many things have you gotten from the house of God? At the house of God, you learn how to serve in excellence. At the house of God, guess what? You can also meet your beloved at the house of God. How many of you know weddings happen at the altars of God? My God, where else would you want to get married? Do you want to get married in some field somewhere or some backyard somewhere? No, I want my wedding to be sanctified at the altar. The Bible says the altar sanctifies. I'll show you here. Somebody say the altar sanctifies. The altar sanctifies. Your children are dedicated at the altar. Where is the altar? In Zion, in God's house. The marriage is dedicated at the altar, in God's house. Hey, God's house is a great thing, and it's good to build the house of God. It's a great thing to build the house of God. Let us see a story of a man who built the house of God. So I hope you've gotten that point. We must be assembled, not gathered, but assembled. Next, we're going to Luke 7, 1 to 5. This will bless you. Luke chapter 7, verse 1 to 5. For those of you watching online, hey, get, get back from your kitchen and get to the word of God. Go to your Bible so you can mark your Bible for yourself. Here we love the word of God. We love the word of God. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, then John. Luke 7, 1 to 5. Luke chapter 7, 1 to 5. The Bible says, Now, when he had ended all his sayings, in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. Uh -huh. And a certain centurion servant, Underline the word centurion servant. Who is a centurion? Centurion is a Roman soldier who leads a hundred soldiers. Centurion means a hundred. A century is a hundred years. Are you connecting it? A century is a hundred years. So a centurion is a Roman soldier who leads a hundred men. A centurion has different men underneath him. And that's important for you to realize. Centurions are actually high-ranked generals. They are high-ranked generals. It's important for you to realize the Bible has no unnecessary detail. You can't just read the Bible. You have to, come on now, read the Bible. The centurion servant, centurion's servant, 
who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. So this centurion soldier who was over a hundred soldiers had one servant, one, who was sick and ready to die. Look at what happened. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews. When the centurion heard of Jesus, he sent the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. Uh -huh. Let's keep going. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. So he sent the Jews, and the Jews went and told Jesus, the centurion is worthy. Think about that. Jews and Romans did not mix. They were against each other. But the Jews, the elders of the church, went to Jesus and said, this centurion is worthy of Jesus going to his house. Do you know you don't read of Jesus going into another Roman soldier's house? The next time Jesus was going into a Roman soldier's was Pilate's and right before the crucifixion. You never read of Jews going into the house of a Roman soldier. But they are saying that this centurion soldier is worthy of Jesus going in there. Of God, the high priest, the God of the Jews going in there what made him worthy what made him accepted that's a question we have to ask ourselves watch this and when they came to jesus they besought him instantly saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this verse 5 for he loved our nation so the number one reason he loved our nation and how did he love the nation? Number two, here is the secret. And has built us a synagogue. He loved our nation and has built us a church. The centurion was a builder of God's house. Look at that. Verse 5, Luke 7, 5. For he loved our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. The only thing that Jesus needed to hear for this man to garner Jesus' attention was that he had built the Jews a synagogue. He was a builder of the Lord's house. Here is the point. When you build God's house, you become accepted. Do you know, in every house, the people who are closest to the vision, the people who help the vision m m happen, they gain favor with God. When you build God's house, that's where I get that point. When you build God's house, God comes to build your house. Jesus was going to a Roman soldier's house for the main reason that this Roman soldier had built a house for God. As you take care of God's house, God takes care of your house. I pray today that God can find somebody. You may not have lived the best life. You may have not have lived the most religious life. But you set your heart to build God a house. You set your heart to build God's house. God, I will make your house a priority. Do you know there is a man that I know who was a businessman? Even in my life, I have one businessman who may have never entered a church recently. But his finances have been used to build the house of God. When you become a god a church builder, you get a special place in the heart of God. You get a special place in the things of God. God is looking for men and women who will say, I may not have all the money to build the, the, the whole church, but I have time 
and I will serve in my church. I will serve in building the Lord's house. Yes, it's the end times, and there are many temptations not to be involved in the things of God's house. But I refuse for temptation to stop me from building the house of God. Why don't you lift up your voice and declare with me right now that I make a heart commitment that I will be a builder of God's house. I will take my skill. I will take my finances. I will take the anointing in my life and I will build the house of God for this end time army to excel in fulfilling the mighty harvest that is coming into the kingdom of God. What does that mean? It means, men, you cannot just be satisfied with attending church. Get involved and be a builder of God's house. Women, don't be satisfied with just sending your children to church. Get involved and be a builder of God's house. When you build God's house, God builds your house. Oh, wow. What a powerful, powerful point. This centurion who was an outcast became accepted because he builds God's house. I declare to you, you shall be accepted in Jesus' mighty name. John chapter 2 verse 17. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 2 verse 17. Thank you, Jesus. I hope you're writing many good points for you to go back and study. You know, one of the good things of technology is you can click pause and go back and watch this over and over again. If you're watching it live, of course, you can watch it later on and let it bless you. John chapter 2, and we are going to verse 17. The Bible says, verse 16, actually, verse 16. Uh, let's, let's read the, the, from verse 15. And he, when he made a scourge of a small cord, he drove them all out of the temple. And the sheep and the oxen poured out the changers' money and overthrew the table. Verse 16, And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Uh -huh. And his disciples, his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. The zeal of your house has eaten me up. Jesus, most of you know the story, Jesus took a cord and went whipping the people who were doing the wrong thing in the house of God. And the disciples looked up and said, wow, I remember it was written, and write this scripture down, this is where it's written, Psalm 69, 8 to 9. We're not going to go there. Make that in your notes. Psalm 69, 8 to 9. It was written, The zeal of God's house has eaten me up. And the disciples are sitting back and watching Jesus clean up the house of God. Now, a lot of people say that, um, Oh, I can worship anywhere because Jesus said to the woman at the well that, um, that, those that worship Jesus worship him in spirit and in truth, so there is no need to go to a temple. Well, the question then becomes, if Jesus did not care about going to a temple, why would he whip people out of a temple? And the disciples say the zeal of the temple has eaten him up. Church, when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, what he was saying is that the temple will become us. The Spirit of God will come and dwell in us. Not that we stop assembling at the temple. He was talking about the indwelling of the Spirit. That we no longer have to depend on a priest to sanctify us. He wasn't totally eliminating the position of the priest. He was saying you'll be able to pray. You'll be able to go to God. You'll be able to seek me. Not that there will be no more needs of priests, no more needs of going to church, no more need of going to the temple. No. What he was saying is that God is making the way for the infilling of the Spirit. But here in John chapter 2, 
we see that Jesus cared about the house of God. The Bible actually says that Jesus went into the temple daily as it was his habit. Why would Jesus go daily so he can show us what we should do? My heart is so broken because services are getting shorter. No one, like we used to have overnight services. Who else is doing that nowadays? We used to have services. The Bible says, David said, better is one day in your house than a thousand anywhere else. We should love the dust of Zion. We should be happy when we gather together. Now, people are coming to church and they are afraid. Afraid of assembling in God's house. Man, the house of God is a place of healing. The house of God is a place of deliverance. And you know, the heart can make us make excuses. The heart can, can lie to you while you don't even know you're being lied to. The Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked. Deceitfully wicked. In other words, it deceives you. So the heart can deceive you not to attend church, not to care for the house of God, while actually you're backsliding. And today I declare over each and every one of you that there will be no backsliders in the house of God. We only get hotter we only get more powerful. We only get more zeal. We only care more and more for the things of God. The Bible says the zeal of the house of God had consumed him. Now I declare unto you from the north, the south, the east, and the west, the zeal of the Lord shall consume you. You shall love the house of God more than ever before. We shall be men and women who the zeal of God's house has consumed us. What happens when the zeal of God's house consumes us? So, we have prayed that you have the zeal of God's house. Now, let's talk about what happens when the zeal has consumed you. Here is a promise. Numbers 25 verse 7. Go with me to Numbers 25 verse 7. I hope you're loving the teaching and it is blessing you. If you love it, put your hands together and give God praise right where you are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Numbers 25, verse 7. The Bible says this, And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, the son of Aaron, the priest, so Aaron, Eleazar, Phinehas, that is a priesthood. The priesthood was transferred from Aaron, Eleazar. Now let's look at Phinehas, the grandson of Eleazar, the priest. Are you with me? Are you with me? Up, the Bible says, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it. Actually, let's, let's, take, let's step back. Let's step back. Let's step back. Verse 5. Verse 5. Oh, it's all so good. Let's go to verse 2. Verse 2, verse 2, verse 2. Quickly, quickly, it's right there. Numbers 25, 2. And we will read it all. And they called the people unto the sacrifice of their gods, small g. And the people did eat and bow to their gods, small g. And Israel joined himself, Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. Baal Peor. Balpior is the, the demon spirit that oversees pornography, nudity, and the pole of Asherah. The Asherah pole is the one that, the spirit that says it's okay to look at a naked woman. If you want to be freed from pornography, freed from sexual bondages, the Asherah is the demon that oversees that kind of behavior like seductive dancing in movies, seductive dancing in, uh, in music videos, is the demon of the Asherah, the Asherah. When you look at strip clubs, they dance on a pole. That is called the Asherah pole in the spiritual realm. So if you have a strip club in your city that you want to bring down, you pray against Baal Peor. Baal Peor is the pimp, to Asherah. Asherah is the demon spirit 
that brings pornography into cities, brings wickedness into cities, and Baal Peor is the pimp or the god that oversees. If you want to learn more about gods and principalities, look up my teachings on angels. We talk about principalities, powers, and rulers. So the principality is Baal Peor, the power is the Asherah. And if you have questions about that, reach out to me directly and I can answer. So for the sake of our context, that's, uh, that's what you need to know. And, and Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Wherever you see Israel joining themselves with Baal Peor, you always look for sexual perversion. When Baal Peor enters a church, sexual perversion is what begins to rule. So Baal Peor joined herself, Israel joined himself to Baal Peor. What does that mean? It means the royal priesthood and the royalty of Israel began having sex with non-believers, with adulterers, with nudity, people of nudity, pornography, and things like that. I hope you understand the teaching, and I hope the teaching is sinking in. Um, and the Lord said unto Moses, so the Lord was angry that they are having uh, those kind of relations. And the Lord said unto Moses, take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. So the leaders had already begun having sex and they had begun shaming the name of God. Uh -huh. The Bible says any, any sin that you commit other than the sin of fornication, the sin of fornication is within the flesh. It is a spiritual covenant. When you have sex out of marriage, you still have a covenant. And God is a covenant-keeping God. So when you have sexual activities out of your intimacy with God, you're giving your intimacy to someone else, which is why God was angry, very fiercely angry. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye everyone his men, that were joined unto Baal Peor. The word joined unto Baal Peor is anyone who had had sexual intimacy with Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel, watch this, came and brought unto his brethren a Midian woman in the sight of Moses. And in the sight of all the congregation, the children of Israel, whom were weeping before the door, of the tabernacle of the congregation. So Israel is weeping. Israel is crying. The plague has hit. They are fornicating sex with all the leaders, sexual immorality. And one of the leaders, the young man, brings a lady, one of the goddesses of Baal Peor, and look at what he does. He brings a median woman. At the door of the tabernacle where Moses was. So in front of Moses, he begins to have sex in God's house. He begins to do sexual acts in God's house. He begins to do sexual activity outside the temple. Look at verse 7. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from amongst the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through. And the man of Israel and the woman threw her belly. So Phinehas took a spear and shot it through that both of them while they were having sex. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. 
the moment the spear was thrust, the plague was stayed. Now, these people are having sex at the door of the church. They're having sex in the church. And Phineas throws the spear and kills them both. And killing them both, the plague was stopped. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous. There is that word again. Remember in Psalm 69, the zeal. Remember in Luke 7, the zeal. Phinehas was zealous, and his zeal turned away the plague. Watch this. From the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Ah, wherefore, say, behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace, and it shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. Because zealous, because Phineas had a zeal for God's house and he cleaned up God's house, what did God do? God gave him a covenant of peace. A covenant of peace. When you have a zeal, for God's house, God gives you a covenant of peace. Do you know, just by connecting to the church, just by connecting to God's house, you have a covenant of peace. Somehow there is peace in your house. Somehow there is joy in your house. Somehow God gives you a covenant of peace. Feeling us, my God, that can preach on its own. But Phineas has had a zeal. He was, that is why I'm preaching to you like this. Because I am like Phineas. I've seen something has gone wrong in the house of God. And it's time for us to correct what has gone wrong. We cannot let people on Facebook just be talking anyhow about God's house. We must contend for the faith. We must show that there are believers who still believe the altar sanctifies what is my point? Phineas had a zeal for God's house and that brought him peace. I pray today as you have a zeal for the house of God, you receive peace in your house. I release peace in abundance. Peace overflowing. Lift up your hands and receive this. Peace overflowing in your house because you're faithful to God's house. How many people have been blessed by just being faithful to the house of God? Let us continue. Already we have seen that building the house of God brings you favor with God. In other words, as you're building God's house, he's building yours. That is Luke chapter 7, where the centurion, who Jesus should have never gone in his house, went to the centurion's house, and uh, the servant was healed. You can read the rest of the story. Actually, he sent his word and healed him. And... Um, Next, the zeal of God's house brings you peace. And um, we are also going to see in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Very famous scripture, so I'm not going to read the whole of it. When you take care of God's house, God rebukes the devourer on your behalf. Malachi says, with a man rob God, and we say, why have you robbed me? He says, in tithes and offering. You have robbed God in tithes and offering. And what have you robbed God of? You don't rob God of your $100. No, no, no. You rob God of the opportunity to touch many lives. The reason why we have technology to bring the gospel, technology to advance the gospel, is because uh, people give into the house of God. So when you give God into God's house, there is provision in God's house, God's house is provided for, and also 
God protects your house. The, this world is full of many curses, and the many curses you need God on your side for your uh, for you to be blessed. That is um, Malachi chapter three, ten to sixteen. Read it at your convenience. Thank you, Jesus. The house of God, the house of God, also uh, Psalms one or two verse thirteen to fourteen is a powerful scripture. The Bible says, let's go there, Psalms 102, Psalms 102, Psalms 102 talks about favor, 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 you gain favor, write that point, you gain favor, the Bible says Psalms 102, and we are going from um, verse, verse 12, but thou, O Lord, shall endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion. For the time to favor her, yea, the said time is come. There are two blessings. Next point, you receive mercy and favor from Zion. Zion is God's house. We've said Zion is a church the literal house of God. And also Zion is God's people. For the servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. When you favor the stones, you favor the dust. What does that mean? In the good days, the bad days, you care about God's house. You know, we are all not perfect. There are people in God's house who are not perfect. So when you think about the dust of Zion... It's easy to say, you know, when the house of God, whether the chairs are soft and comfortable. You know, in America, we have nice soft chairs. There are parts of the world where there are no chairs. You're sitting on the floor. Either way, love the house of God. Favor the dust of Zion. Don't wait for big screens. And we thank God for screens. Right now, you're watching me through a screen, so we thank God for them. But favoring the dust of Zion. Also, the dust of Zion is looking at other people and loving them because God loved them. The other day, my son said to me, Dad, do you favor the dust of me? Because I had told him one of my sons is called Zion, the other one is called Zachariah. So I was saying in prayer that we favor the dust of Zion. And he stopped and said, Dad, do you favor the dust of me? And then I said, yes, I favor the dust of Zachariah. Then Zachariah looked at me and said, But dad, I'm not dusty. I'm clean. And you know, out of the mouth of babes, the Lord has ordained praise. What does that mean? Even when other people are not where we think they should be, we still love them and still favor them and still care for them as God loved us. Amen? Amen. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 verse 2, Isaiah 53 verse 2, Go with me there real quick. Isaiah 53, verse 2. If you're in the Psalms, just turn left and you will end up in Isaiah 53, verse 2. The Bible says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form, no comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Talking about Jesus, there was no duty, that beauty to desire of him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquitted with grief. And we hid as, we, as it were our face from him, and he was despised and we esteemed him not. There was a time Jesus was not desirable, but he still loved us when we did not love him. So even when Jesus is being rejected by others, we, the church, should not reject him. The Bible says that when we accept him or when we exalt him, when we love him in front of men, he will accept us in front of, other, in front of God. So don't reject God when you see the world is standing against Jesus. Don't shy away from saying the name of Jesus Christ when you see that others have shied away from the name of Jesus Christ. Next, 
we are going to Psalms 118 verse 22. Psalms 118 verse 22. Go with me to the book of Psalms 118 verse uh, 22. Again, if you're in Isaiah, just go this way. And I, th I guess it's your left, my right. Uh, and you'll find Psalms. Just keep going, you'll find Psalms. Psalms 118, Psalms 102, uh, verse. Psalms 102. And we are going to um, verse, Psalms 102, and we're going to... No, sorry, we're going to Psalms 118. Yes, that was correct. We have already read Psalms 102. So write this down, Psalms 118, and we are going to verse 20. Psalms 118, verse 20, let us read. This gate of the Lord, unto which the righteous shall enter. Talking about the gate of God's house. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. When you're in the gate, the Lord hears you. So in God's house, he hears you. The stone which the builders refused is become the head of the stone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Prosperity is a blessing that is found in God's house. In God's house, you prosper. In God's house, you prosper many ways. The Bible says the Lord uh, delights in the prosperity of his servants. Add that point to your notes. Prosperity is a blessing of building God's house. You prosper when you build God's house. Watch this. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord pours out blessings. God is the Lord which has shown us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord for his good, his mercy endures forever. At the altar, you get to bind your sacrifice. Let's talk a little bit about that. You know, the altar is very powerful. The altar is very powerful. Matthew 23 verse 19 tells us, the altar sanctifies. So, when you love to build God's house, you have an altar that you can take your offering to. Do you know the Bible tells us in the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Nama, Deuteronomy and Numbers, sorry, in the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Numbers, the Bible tells us that God chooses a place where you should take your offering there. So God just doesn't desire you to not have a church. Where are you going to pay your tithe? Oh, you know, someone says, oh, I'll send my tithe to the, uh, to the local mission. The local mission has no altar. The tithe belongs to an altar. The tithe belongs to, oh, I'll take my, my offering and feed the poor. It's good to feed the poor, but the tithe belongs to God's house. The tithe belongs to an altar. And you want the benefit of your money being sanctified? Do you know for every three dollars, one of them has been used for something wicked? As in unclean business before it got to you? The altar sanctifies. Read it. Matthew 23, verse 19. The altar will sanctify your finances. And a lot of people are living under a financial curse because they have not followed God's method when it comes to their money. Church, these keys, these are the things that God is trying to cut you away from, to stop God's people from. If you don't care for God's house, you don't care for God's altar. And then you wonder why people get into problems and problems and problems, because they are not connected to an altar. 
Somebody say, I will be connected to an altar. Psalms 122, verse 1 to 6. I won't read it for the sake of time, but I want you to go to, 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 um, to make a note of it. Psalms 122, verse 1 to 6 gives us a lot more benefits of building God's house. The Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of God. What does that mean? Going to the house of God gives you joy. How many of you can truly say today is your best day of the week? As in coming to God's house, this is your day. My God, Sunday we had a blast at the house of God. Do you know last week uh, we were in the, in the camp with all the youth and they, we had a great time enjoying time in the house of God. There is joy in God's house. Make this last couple of points as we come to a close. And this is your homework. Go read Psalms 122, the whole of it. Gladness comes from the house of God. Next, your feet within the house of God. As you go in the house of God, you're able to present yourself and appear before God's house. And he is able to give you peace and able to sanctify you. Then David says, David says in Psalms 122, Peace be within thy walls. We have already talked about the covenant of peace. Here it is again. Peace within your walls. For being a builder of God's house. Prosperity within your places or within your borders. Prosperity. When you build God's house, you prosper. The Bible says that better is one day in the house of God than a thousand anywhere else. When you love the house of God, when you take care of the house of God, guess what also happens? Your children and your children's children learn how to serve God. Church, do you know your church attendance is more than about you? You know, we thank God for Facebook. We thank God for YouTube and online church. But the reality is, while you are watching church online, what are your kids doing? The devil is not just after this generation when it comes to um, church and stopping the love of the church. The devil is after the generations to come. Now, hey, I love technology. We use technology to preach the gospel. And many people are reached through the gospel through technology. But even after you've been reached through technology, you need to be a builder of God's house. Don't just be a receiver. Be a contributor. Your Christian life will never mature to its fullest potential until you begin building God's house. My desire for you is that today's teaching has truly blessed you. And you've understood the importance of you being part of a local church. Especially in these last days. I haven't even talked about the communion, the gathering, the blessings of having friends. You find wives, you, find, you know, a wife, sorry. You find a wife and all that stuff. <laughs> Let's clean that up. You, you, you're blessed by being connected to a local church. I want to pray for you as we come to an end of today's teaching. And where you are, I want, I want us, as I pray, even you step into prayer and begin to pray for your local church. Begin to pray and thank God that we are part of the body of Jesus Christ. Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. For everyone who's watching and hearing and listening to what You've spoken to us through your word. Lord, right now we possess the blessings of being a builder of God's house. Lord, the centurion was such a great example of an outcast who built the synagogue. And because he built the synagogue, he became accept accepted. Lord, may your people become, become accepted because they are builders 
of God's house. Lord, I pray for everyone at Eternal Life Harvest Center. We shall be builders of your house. Everyone at GM, we shall be builders of your house. Firebrand Nation, we shall be builders of your house. The whole glory network of churches, we shall be builders of your house. The whole JBN television network is there to build God's house. Lord, let us be men and women who build the house of God and build it for your purpose. That at the end of the day, we shall be men of zeal like Phinehas and men of zeal like Jesus Christ. We come against every spirit of wickedness that would speak or lie to us that going to church is not important, going to small groups, joining e-life groups, and joining, joining home sales is not important. We come against that wicked spirit in the mighty name of Jesus Christ and stand on Hebrews chapter 10 that we will not forsake the assembling of one another, especially as we see the day approaching. Lord, your word tells us in 2 Thessalonians that they shall be a great falling away. Lord, I declare that for me and my house, we don't fall out, we fall in, into your house and into your glory and into your things. We love you. We love the dust of Zion in Jesus' mighty name. May you receive every blessing. May you receive every covenant. May you receive every promise that we have prayed about. God bless you. Go ahead and close the service. And may the Lord be with each and every one of you. See you soon. Love you. Love God. Love others passionately. Can you thank God for that awesome word tonight? Thank God for that awesome word. I love that our pastor is a teacher. You know, he doesn't have to be in the house because the word was in the house tonight. The word quickens us. The word makes us alive. The words that I speak unto you, he said, are spirit and they are life. I thank God that we are builders of the Lord's house. If you would stand with me tonight, I would like for us before we leave, pastor, as he mentioned tonight, he and Pastor Ashley and the team is at Pastor Parsley's church. And they're going to be doing Anacazo, working with them. And we just want to pray for them, that God would protect them, that he would bring a lot of souls into the kingdom, declare the blessing on them, and then we'll dismiss tonight. Father God, we glorify your mighty name. We thank you, God, for your goodness, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Father, for this great house. And Lord God, we declare tonight that we love you and that we love the dust of Zion. Father, we are so grateful. Like David said, we were glad when they said let us come into the house of the Lord and we thank you father for the great blessing that is on this house father we thank you for pastor Evans we thank you for pastor Ashley we thank you for their family. Father, we thank you for their vision. We thank you for the foundation of this house. And Lord God, we release the blessing upon them. We thank you, Lord God, that right now angels watch over them. That they encamp around about them on the north and the south and the east and on the west. We declare their strength is in the Lord, Father. And we call in much souls, Father God, much fruit to this, the kingdom of God. We pray, Lord God, that you would guide them everything that they do and everything that they say. That your anointing would be so powerful, Lord, and that many will be one to the Lord. We release them tonight, Father God, to do a great work for you, Lord God, and we come into agreement. God, we come into agreement right now for souls in the kingdom. We thank you, Lord God, that our pastors are kingdom builders tonight, and we thank you, Lord God, that we are kingdom builders. We thank you that the same thing that is on the head of this house, Lord God, flows down into the body, and we declare, God, that we are not defeated that we are so winners and that we would do a work for you, Lord God, that Knoxville will know that they shall be saved in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Father God, we thank you that you keep us, that you guard us, that you guide us. We thank you, Lord God, that the same fire that was on the mountain at the Yakma tree dwells in each one of us, Father God. We declare that we are not dry, but God, that we are vessels of honor fit for the master's use. And Lord God, we declare that we would declare your name mighty. Lord in this world Father and we thank you Lord that you do all things well Father God we release everyone to go safely Lord that you guide them that your angels watch over them that your Holy Spirit 
remember, remind us, Lord, of every word that was spoken tonight. And Lord God, we declare for you our love for you and our love for your house. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father, and amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Jesus' name, love God, love others passionately. You're dismissed. God bless you.